So, two things. So I hope that everyone here realizes the kind of support that you have from our community, right? We should, we should be very, very clear that you live in a town, Amherst, that takes issues of immigrant rights very seriously. Right? So seriously that we took you out of class, <laughs> right? That's how seriously we take it. Okay? So the other thing <coughs> is that, anybody got one of these? Right? Or you will. Mm -hmm. So the point of today, the point of today is good information. Good information. These good folks are here to make sure that you leave with good information about your rights. So what does that mean that you need to do? Everybody needs to pay close attention, right? I appreciate everybody being here. I'm going to introduce, this is our superintendent, Dr. Morris, and he will offer a welcome as well, okay? Thank you, Mark. So um, I just want to say I'm appreciative of the high school for allowing you out of class. Right? That's all that class I wrote today, kind of. So I want to <laughs> acknowledge uh, the high school for, for allowing this to happen and, and promoting it. And I want to say this really came, the, the idea to organize the event came from concerns we were hearing from you all, from the community, about what, uh, what rights you had given the national climate. And so today, I think the goal is to answer that question so everyone can leave here feeling more comfortable, more confident uh, in what those are. So this, as, as Jackie said, we're going to offer accurate information. Um, our presenters are, you know, they can describe, they'll describe themselves mm -hmm. in a bit, but mm -hmm. they're attorneys, but they're not, um, they're not people who can give individual advice to you uh, on specific cases, but they did list resources there. But the goal of today, again, is to just make sure everyone has, knows what their rights are when they leave the room. Um, the other piece I want to share is just the context, that our community and our schools are going out of our way, you know, uh, the way we need to, to make sure everyone has uh, both accurate information and knows that our schools are safe for all of our students and all of our families. Uh, we've passed multiple resolutions. There's a policy that our school committee is trying to pass to ensure that our school system remains a safe place and is a sanctuary for students and families within our community. And uh, our community, our larger community, is working on that same matter as well. So today's event is in a larger context of how do we make sure that everyone feels safe and everyone feels fully part of our community. If you have ideas how we can do that better, how we can continue to do that, talk to your teachers, talk to Mr. Jackson. My office is at the middle school. You're welcome to come anytime, and I'm happy to hear what we can do to continue to support you. Uh, that's our goal. Um, this, I wanted to say one other quick thing before we turn to presenters is that this uh, presentation is being videotaped, <coughs> but the only pe people being videotaped are the people here. So um, if you know, like, Mr. Champagne's back there in this dark room and he's videotaping it because we want to make sure that we have this presentation available for people who couldn't be here today. Uh, could be for family members who couldn't be here, could be for anyone, uh, but no one other than mm -hmm. us uh, are being videotaped. So I just, if you notice that someone's doing like sound and all that kind of stuff, that's what's happening with that. So I think I will turn it over okay. to our presenters and okay. let them introduce okay. themselves. Okay. Hi. Hi, everybody. My name's Alethea O'Donnell. I live in Amherst. Um, I'm a parent of a high schooler and a middle schooler and um, had reached out to Mike and Mark about doing this presentation. I've been doing this presentation um, in some different areas for a while, so we were really excited that they took us up on the offer to do this for you guys today. And I'm Abby Danak, and I work with Alethea, and um, I don't have high school children. I have small <laughs> children, but uh, we're here to present this information to you today. Right. So um, as Mike said, um, I am an attorney, and Abby is a paralegal. Um, we work in the law department at a big company in Springfield called Mass Mutual. Has anybody ever heard of Mass Mutual? Does that ring a bell? No. <laughs> anyway, that's fine. <laughs> it's where we work. But, um, but we are not immigration lawyers, okay? So just to be clear, um, that is not what we do for a living. So what we want to give to you today is a presentation. We're working with an organization out of Boston called PAIR, which is the Political Asylum and Immigration Rights 
project. They put together this presentation. We're gonna deliver this to you guys today. Um, we cannot give specific kind of legal advice about situations involving yourself or a family member. So if you have very specific questions about your own situation or a family member situation, at the end of today, we're gonna have some resources for people that you can call. But today is really to give you an overview of your rights. Could, could, could translators just be sure that you, you know, because what, what she said just now was kind of important, yep. that they can't give legal advice, but they want people to know their rights, and they will take questions at the end, yep. right? Yeah. yeah, we'll actually take questions through the whole thing, and we're gonna to try to go slow for translation. English and Spanish. Also, everybody should pick up this paper that says Know Your Rights. I, some of you have it, some of you don't. This is a paper that talks about immigration law resources in Western Massachusetts. So make sure you get this also. And this paper, which also says where you can call if you need help or your family needs help. So thank you for providing all of this wonderful information. It's up here. Ms. Abdel's giving some. Don't leave without it. Good. Okay, so we're going to get started. And speak yeah, into the mic. Thank you. <laughs> So our goals for today are understanding the current situation on the ground, understanding your rights when encountered by immigration officers, understanding what you can do to prepare yourself and your family, and understanding where to go for help. So executive orders. The president has the power to issue executive orders at any time. Um, who's heard about President Trump's executive orders on immigration? Um, what have you heard is included? Like no one. Uh, is it possible that there will be new executive orders? So there were two orders on January 25th, 2017. One order focused on border security on the border and the other on interior security within the United States. They were to build a wall along the southern border, increase border patrol by 5,000 officers, increase ICE by 10,000 officers, expand expedited removal to anyone in the United States for two years or less, removal without the chance to see a judge, and to expand cooperation with local police, known as the 287G program, although many Massachusetts police departments have promised not to do this, such as Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, and others. I just want to jump in because before we started, um, some people asked some questions about Amherst as a sanctuary city. Amherst as a sanctuary city. Have people heard about Amherst as a sanctuary city? Have people been following any of this on the news? Anybody heard of this? So um, I, for purposes of today, if you haven't heard about it, um, we can't really give you specific advice on kind of what's going on with Amherst or kind of the, the um, situation in Amherst. Um, but I know that there is discussion about what does it mean to be a sanctuary city and how do sanctuary cities work and their local police work with, the, with um, sort of the – with ICE or with other federal police officers or state police officers. So we know that that's a question, and it's something that we don't have a lot of detail on today, but we're aware of it. We're going to take that question back actually to pair. And, and if people have questions about where that process is in Amherst, I can answer that at the end. That's okay. Like comfortable yeah, yeah, yeah. where we are in process and Perfect. what's being okay. proposed. And okay. so I'm happy to address those if it's useful. I, do people want to know about it now? I mean, we could do it right now if people want to. Yeah, yeah people do? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So um, our uh, local 
uh, so we're not officially, Amherst is not officially a sanctuary city right now. However, a few years ago, they did pass, um, town meeting passed some guidance for the town and uh, our police officers, and this came out in a, a, resol or a statement from myself, the police chief and the town manager last month, that uh, our police officers uh, are not acting as agents for immigration, where some police officers in certain places are. In Amherst, that's not the case. And there's a resolution that will be voted on this spring, next, in the next month or two, uh, at town meeting to officially make Amherst a sanctuary city. And that has the full support of the select board, who's kind of our Congress, so to speak, uh, or getting to our Congress, our, our legislators. And so that will come up and be decided probably in the month of May. And we'll communicate that out through the school so that everyone's aware of that, that process. But right now, our police um, do not act as ICE agents in Amherst. Uh, and if we become a sanctuary city, we'll certainly let you know. Um, and I think it has a lot of support in our community so for Amherst to be officially a sanctuary city. Thanks. On February 20th, the Department of Homeland Security issued two memoranda. Many more immigrants without documents are now a priority for detention and removal, including those who have committed acts which are considered to be a criminal offense, even if they have not been charged have been charged with a criminal offense, even if they have not been convicted, have been convicted of a criminal offense, have engaged in fraud in connection with any official matter before a governmental agency, such as in a driver's license application, have abused any program related to the receipt of public benefits, have a deportation order no matter how old, and in the judgment of an immigration officer, pose a risk to public safety or national security. Mm -hmm. I just have, I'm gonna keep jumping up and down, sorry. <laughs> a couple things to add here um, on the first one. So committed acts which are considered to be a criminal offense. So um, in the judgment of some um, law enforcement, crossing the border illegally is considered to be a criminal offense. So just so you guys are aware of that, so that in itself of just crossing, you know, the southern border or another border illegally could be considered to be a criminal offense. And then um, for number four, fraud in connection with an official matter before a governmental agency, um, using a fake social security number could be considered fraud um, if you had applied for a job and used a fake social security number. So we just want people to be aware of some of the things that um, Department of Homeland Security and ICE are, th are the way they consider this and the way they think about this. Are there any questions on that? Okay. On January 27th, the president issued an executive order that tried to stop people from mostly Muslim countries from entering the United States. Nationwide protests took place in airports around the country and lawsuits were filed in five states resulting in stopping the executive order that banned immigrants and refugees from seven countries. On March 6th, a new executive order was issued restricting travel for nationals from six mostly Muslim countries, the same as the January 27th ban minus Iraq. So the following part is on hold due to a nationwide temporary order from federal courts of Hawaii and Maryland. Foreign nationals from Sudan, Syria, Yemen, Iran, Somalia, and Libya who are outside of the United States and who do not have a valid visa as of January 27, 2017 will not be allowed to enter the United States for at least 90 days. Nationals of these countries with visas will not be revoked as a result of the order. Green card holders, individuals with asylum or refugee status, and individuals with TPS should not be affected. Nationals from Iraq are no longer affected, and DHS can add additional countries to the ban list. A 
Again, the following part is on hold due to a nationwide temporary order from federal courts of Hawaii and Maryland. The United States Refugee Admissions Program is temporarily suspended for the next 120 days. Individuals already granted refugee status will not be affected. The total refugee number for fiscal year 2017 will be 50,000. And we do not know what will happen after the 120-day period, and it may differ based on the country, so please stay informed. <clears throat> If you are from one of the six affected countries and wish to travel, no matter your status, talk to a lawyer to discuss the risks of traveling outside of the United States. So there's no action on the deferred action for childhood arrivals for now. DACA was created by executive action under President Obama. Criminal convictions can either bar DACA or prevent renewal. Non-citizens should not apply for DACA for the first time or apply to renew DACA status without consulting an immigration attorney. So just to repeat, non-citizens should not apply for DACA for the first time or apply to renew DACA status without consulting with an immigration attorney. And you have, um, either you have listings of attorneys here or they're over on the side table. So this one's really important, I think, for this group because of young people. You want to talk to a lawyer before you think about applying for DACA. <laughs> So expect new executive orders to be issued soon. This is a website that you can go to for information and for current information and fact sheets, um, masslegalhelp.org backslash immigration. And you can go there to find information. So that was a lot of information. Are there any questions before we move on? I know there's a lot to take in there. There's been a lot going on. So do you guys have any questions before we keep going? I think that's a, I, I don't know exactly what that stands for. I think it's a type of temporary status. Yeah, TPS, does anybody know what that is? I think it's a temporary status of some kind. I don't know it off the top of my head, sorry. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll keep moving. Oh, so, so the next section, what we're going to talk about is if you are confronted by an ICE officer, immigration officer, and we have some different um, situations that we're going to talk about at work, um, at, in your home, and um, in a car. So we're going to talk about some situations. So this is really important, and you guys should all have the red card. If you don't, we have piles of them over there. Um, it's a red card. And what it has on the red card are your rights. These are the rights that every single person in the United States has under the Constitution, whether you are a citizen or not. So I'll take a minute so people can get it, make sure they get red cards. There are plenty of these, so please feel free to take them for your family or your friends who aren't here today, okay? Exactly. There's Spanish and English. One side is in English. One side is in Spanish. Uh, that I don't know because I don't speak Spanish. Are they a little bit different? So focus on the English. <laughs> we didn't do the translating. <laughs> So I'm just going to keep going. It looks like there's a little confusion about the cards, but in any event, focus on the English part. Um, so these are your rights, regardless of whether you're a citizen or not. And how you respond to meeting an immigration officer can depend on your immigration status. And we're going to talk about the rights on this card, okay? So here's the question. If you're stopped by an immigration officer, should you show your identification to prove that you're here legally? 
the answer, I heard a no. Okay, excellent. Anybody else have any other opinions? Should you show identification if you're stopped? I heard another no, I think. <laughs> so if you have, so here's the thing, it's kind of two different pieces. If you do have immigration status, so if you have a green card, if you're applying for asylum, um, if there are sort of some of the other situations where you are here legally, you might wish to show your identification. In those cases, it might be safe to show your identification to prove you're here illegally. If you don't have legal immigration status, you may wish not to give any identification, don't show any ID, don't show a passport until you've spoken to a lawyer. Um, it's your choice. You can do what you want to do, but we're trying to give you some guidance that if you don't have legal status, you may not want to show any identification until you get a chance to talk to a lawyer. Oh, and to answer the TPS question, from before, temporary protected status. Thank you, Mark. So here are the basic rights if you're confronted by an immigration officer, and they are on this card, okay? So you have, and these are, uh, by the way, these are very similar to your Miranda rights. Oh, yeah. Wait, I have a question. Can you, um, TPS stands for what? Uh, temporary protected status. It's a status under immigration law. I don't know the details of it, yeah. Yeah. Um, so these are the same rights you have whether you're a citizen or not, not a citizen. They're very similar to the rights that you can um, state if you're ever um, accused of a crime. So they're the same rights. You have the right to remain silent. So that means you have the right not to answer any questions. So if the police stop you, you have the right to say nothing. Um, you have the right to ask for an arrest warrant. So if somebody says you're being arrested, you have the right to say, I'd like to see the warrant. Sure, a warrant is basically a judge saying you're going to be arrested. You, we think that you may have committed a crime or um, we, it is a piece of paper. Yes, I'm sorry. Yep, a warrant is a piece of paper. We're going to actually show some examples. So I'm going to have some examples for you guys in a little bit. You always have the right to ask for a lawyer and you have the right to, to make a phone call. Now, one thing that's a little different, um, you may have heard this um, with criminal law, that people have the right to an attorney. In immigration law, you do not have the right to an attorney to be paid, that, that um, the government will pay for a lawyer for you if you can't afford one. That is not true in immigration law. That is true in criminal law, not true in immigration law. So you may have to pay for the lawyer or find a lawyer who can do it for free. But I think people get confused and they think they have the right to a lawyer and they don't necessarily have the right to a lawyer appointed for them. Does that make sense? Do people understand that? Any questions on that? Okay. So if an immigration officer comes and confronts you, if you assert your rights and if you say, I have the right to remain silent or I want to see a piece of paper that's an arrest warrant, and if the police, if the government violates that, you might be able to use that to help you later on. So that's why it's important to assert your rights. Another couple of things that you should think about, you never ever want to lie. So it's better to say nothing than to lie. So um, if you have fraudulent documents, so say you have an ID card and it's not really a true license um, you know, issued by the state of Massachusetts, or you have a passport and it's a fake passport, do not show it because that can actually get you into more trouble down the road. Um, and then you may choose to say nothing. It's better to say, I'd like to be silent, I'd like to remain silent, than to lie, because lying can really get you into trouble down the road. So now I'm going to talk about what you have the right to do at home. So if an immigration officer comes to your home and knocks on your door, what can you do? So you have the right to not open the door. If you look out the window and you see it's an immigration officer, you can choose to keep the door closed and not open the door. You can take this card, you know your rights card, and that's why it's important to hold on to this and maybe even grab a few more on your way out and give some to your family and your friends. You can slide this card under the door, or if you have a window next to your door, you can hold this card up to the window so they can read it, okay? So they can see that you're asserting your rights. You can ask them, do you have a warrant? And if you have a warrant, slide it under the door so you can take a look at it. And we're going to show you copies of what's a good warrant and what's not a good warrant. 
and we're going to teach you guys what to look for to see that it's really a, a true warrant. You want to make sure that the warrant is signed by a judge, not just by an immigration officer, but by a judge, and we're going to show you an example of that. If the, if the immigration officers or the police come to your door, call a friend who's a U.S. citizen or a family member and let them know what's happening. And then call an experienced immigration lawyer. And that's important, that it be an immigration lawyer. This is a very special, specialized area of the law. It's very detailed. You want to call somebody who really understands this kind of law. So this is, a, this is an example. I'm going to read it. And then I'm hoping that you guys can maybe give me some, um, put your hands up with some answers to what you think are the right answers. So it's, a, it's an example of a woman named Anna, who's an undocumented immigrant from El Salvador. So she's not, she doesn't have papers to be here legally. She comes home after work, and she hears a knock on her door. She looks through the, the peephole, and she says, who's there? And a man and a woman are standing outside the door, and they say that they're immigration officers. She asks what they want, and they say, we're looking for a woman named Maria Martinez. And Anna says, I don't know Maria. I, you know, I don't know who she is. Then they say, well, what's your name? And they say, open the door, because we need to see your identification to make sure you're not Maria. We want to make sure you're not lying. So what can Anna do? Yep. Show, up, show her card? Absolutely, yep. She can show her red card. What else can she do? Yeah, sure, yeah. So actually what I was just thinking of, um, one way to do this is to talk about this with your neighbor or small groups and come Perfect. back Perfect. in three minutes. So do you mind just restating the, the question of what sure. they should do and they can work in small groups and yes, come back? Yes, that's a great idea. So there's two questions. What are Anna's rights? And can the officers come into her home? So what are Anna's rights, and can they come into her home? So why don't you guys talk about that for two to three minutes, and then we'll come back, and I'm going to look for some answers. Exactly. Right. Because <laughs> we don't really well and this is like this is like made for all different audiences, right? So this is this is a different where I had the church and then we had the refugees who were part and they're in the citizenship class. They were very active and vocal. Uh, the ones that we had at the Grey House last week. So he was super helpful, yeah. So it was kind of nice He's a, he teach he's the adult education coordinator. Yeah, yeah, he's great. He was our coordinator through the whole thing. Yeah, so sort of like the role that Mike's playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Your back hurts. <laughs> How old are your kids? <laughs> Two weeks later, still aching. <laughs> Has it been? Okay, so can we get some answers? What do you guys think? What are Anna's rights? Can you say that again? Not open the door. Yep, absolutely. Does she have any other rights? Yes. Ask for a warrant. Absolutely. Yeah. Does she have any other rights? Anything else you guys can think of? Somebody in the back? Yep, go ahead. To remain silent, absolutely. I think you guys got the big ones. Anything else anybody wants to add? Anything else? No, okay. So how about the next one? Can the officers come into Anna's home? No, excellent. You guys got that one. 
All right. So this is going to be, um, I'm just going to sort of answer some of the questions that you guys already answered. So because Anna is not documented, she can choose not to open the door. Um, and the part of the reason for this, and Abby talked about the new executive orders that are out. So these are the new orders that were issued by the president. Anyone who doesn't have papers is considered high priority, so sort of top of the list for detention. So it used to be that that was a little bit different. Um, they were focusing on people who had committed serious crimes. That is no longer the case. Anyone without papers is considered a high priority. Anna has the right to remain silent, and I heard you guys say that. She has the right to show her uh, red card, to slide it under the door, or put it in a window, absolutely right. And she has the right to ask to see a warrant, um, slide under the door, and see if it's signed by a judge. And I think the next slides are going to show us what that looks like. Yeah. So this is important. So this is a warrant that's signed by a judge. And here's how you can tell. So if you look at the very top. Is this like the pointer? Oh, yeah. We'll do the pointer. There we go. Yeah, perfect. So see you guys over there at the very top. It says United States District Court. That's a federal court. So that's with a judge. Um, a judge presides in a United States District Court. And then if you look at the very bottom right, signature of the judge, it says judge on it. So that's an example of a, a what's a good warrant. This is a warrant that's signed by a judge. Now here, next we're going to show you an example of a warrant that's not a good warrant. This is one not signed by a judge. How do you do that pointer? The red oh, the red. Okay. I'm going to try to see. I think it's a little hard for me to see. I think right here. See where I'm pointing right here and it says immigration officer? An immigration officer is not a judge. So this is not a valid warrant. This is not a good warrant. So do you guys have any questions about that? Would you be able to tell a good warrant and a not a good warrant? I think on the previous slide. Oh, go ahead. Right. Like, so, so this one says U.S. Department of Homeland Security, which is mm. different than what the previous one yes. said. Sorry, I mistook the. That's okay. The thing right up there, right? And then, on the on the previous slide, where it said the 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 signature of the judge next to it was the printed name of the judge as well. Oh yeah. yeah. So make sure when you're looking at it that it has the, not just the signature but the name on there as well. Right. Perfect. Did somebody have a question? If they have a good warrant, then they, I think probably yes, they could come in if they have a good warrant. Yeah. So, so if, if they don't have a good warrant, then what you can say is, this doesn't look like a good warrant, and I'd like to call an attorney. And I would try at that point. And we're going to talk about this later. Um, a piece of advice is memorize the phone number for a lawyer, okay, because you may not have the time to look it up. You might not have your phone. You might not be able to use your phone. Memorize the name and the phone number of a lawyer, and I would say ask for, say I want to talk to a lawyer. They, just to be honest, they might take you in, though, okay? So just to be honest, if that happens, they might bring you, you know, to their station. Yes. That's a great idea. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So I'll just repeat this because we are being videotaped, and so I want to make sure everybody heard this. This is Patrice, who's another lawyer that we work with. So um, what she said, it would be a good idea to take a photograph and, and keep a photograph and send it maybe to a family member so you have a photograph of exactly what was taken, if you get the chance, right? I guess it, if you can, try to take a picture of it. I think that's a great suggestion. Of the warrant. Either one. Exactly. Yep. Yep. That's a great point. Any other questions on this? Okay. And I think we covered this. Basically, it has to be signed by a judge um, to, to have the right to enter your home. So if it's signed by a judge and it's a good warrant, they can come into your home. So here's the next situation, and I think we have a hypothetical on this, uh, an example on this one too, what to do if you're stopped while driving. So same thing applies. The rights that you have on your red card, these all apply if you're stopped while you're driving or if you're in the car with somebody who gets stopped, okay? So you have the right to remain silent. You have the right to say nothing. Stay calm. Don't run. Don't resist arrest. 
keep your hands where the officer can see them. And so if you're driving, you want to keep your hands on the steering wheel where the officer can see them. The reason for this is because I think when police officers see people moving quickly and moving their hands quickly, they get nervous, right? They don't know if maybe somebody's going for a weapon. They don't really know what you're doing. So in order to try to keep the situation calm, you want to keep your hands on the wheel where he can see them or she can see them. I want to also say, um, go ahead. Just make sure when you are moving, doing anything, getting your ID, looking for anything that you state to the officer exactly what you're doing and you ask for permission from them. Mm -hmm. Officer, I'm going to get my ID. It is in my bag, which is next to me, right? So they know exactly what you're doing. And that's, that's good advice regardless. I actually, I got pulled over for running a stop, light, stop sign <laughs> and I actually knew he was going to ask me for my registration. So I unbuckled leaned over to my glove compartment, got out my registration, and the first thing he asked is, why are you unbuckled? Did you just do that? Did you just move over? And I should have thought of that. I didn't think of that. So that's really good advice. Just stop. If they pull you over, just wait. Let them come to the car. Let them tell you what they want to see, because otherwise you can make them concerned. Um, you do have the right to ask them, am I under arrest or am I free to leave? You can ask that question. And if they say, no, you're not under arrest, you can say, okay, then I'm choosing to leave. But just like Abby said, say that before you go. Say, I'm making the choice to leave. I'm not under arrest, so I'm making a choice to leave. Um, you have, the, yeah, go ahead. I would just add that that, that piece is really tricky, and, and sometimes officers know they don't have the right to arrest, and so they don't ask you. Yeah, come on over. I would just add that that piece is tricky because there's times when officers know they don't have enough to arrest you, but they'll use intimidation and, you know, you making you, – it's an uncomfortable position, right, when, when you're in a in confrontation like that, and that can lead to a situation where then, then they get enough to arrest you because you do something mm -hmm. that's a little scary to them or, or not appropriate in their mind. So really important that you sometimes have a lot more power and rights than you think you have in Absolutely. that situation. And, and that's for everyone. That's regardless of whether you're here legally, whether you're a citizen or not. This is, applies for everybody. Um, we, we have heard about, and I don't know if this is true in Amherst. I don't know if anyone's heard of this, but we've heard of police officers who have small fingerprinting machines. Has anybody heard of this? No, I have. I, I, I don't know. This is an organization in Boston, so it could be Boston's doing this, but police officers who have little machines where they'll try to fingerprint you on the machine, you can say, I don't want to be fingerprinted. So you have the right to say, I'm not going to be fingerprinted. Yes. Why, and so the question was, why would you not want to be fingerprinted? So because if you're not here legally, that would be a way for them to very quickly figure that out. And that can put you at higher risk of deportation. So you don't have to give them information that they could use against you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and you have the right to ask for an attorney. So again, always have a right to ask for an attorney. How many of you guys have jobs? I don't, this is a question about at work. So I can skip this if this is not relevant. I don't know how many people are working. A lot of you guys work. Perfect. Okay, we'll do it. So we've heard of this situation. I have not heard of this in Amherst, but we've heard of this in other places in the country where um, immigration officers are going into um, people's place of work and they're telling them to line up by their immigration status. So line up if you're legal, line up if you're Ill illegal. Again, I have not heard that here, but we want you guys to be aware of it. So if that happens, you can say, you have the right to not answer. I'm not going to answer. You have the right to not line up. You can just stand in the middle of the room and not give any information. Because if you make a decision, if you're not here legally and you put yourself in the side of the room that's not here legally, you might really be putting yourself at risk. You do not have to do that. You have the right to remain silent. You don't have to make that choice. So you have the right to communicate information. Or the, I'm sorry, the right not to communicate information in any way, which could be li lining up. Okay, so here we have another example, and we're going to do the same thing. Um, I'll read the example, and then we want you guys to talk amongst yourselves and then come up with some answers. So this is a hypothetical about someone named Miguel. He's undocumented. One day he is stopped by an immigration officer while he's waiting for the bus. 
The officer asks him for his name and to see identification. So the officer has one of those electronic fingerprint machines I was talking about, and he says, I'd like to see your fingerprints. So here are the questions I want you guys to think about. What are his rights? Does he have the right to remain silent? Can he refuse fingerprints? And can he ask if he's under arrest? So just take a few minutes and just talk about this one as if this you know, were a real situation. What do you think he could do? Okay, you guys, so let's go back to this example. So for Miguel, he's undocumented, he stopped while waiting for the bus, and they want to take his fingerprints. Does he have the right to remain silent? Yes, he does. Excellent. Can he refuse to give his fingerprints? Yes, he can. Can he ask if he's under arrest? Yes. And if the officer answers, no, you're not under arrest, he can say, I'm going to walk away. He should say it first, I'm going to walk away. Okay. Okay. Question. Question. Yes. So the red card. Mm -hmm. You presented it as sort of the thing at home to show. It, seems like it should go in your wallet. Yep. So you could use it if you didn't have your words. Mm -hmm. You could use it at the bus stop. Absolutely. We we advise people to keep that in their wallet, you know, or keep it on your purse or wherever you know. Keep it tucked one in the back of your phone. One on the door at home. And one Take a door. couple. Yep. Yeah. yep. Yeah. Keep them. Okay, so here are some tips. So we're going to try to um, keep things going here. Um, so these are some things to think about. As I said before, memorize the phone number of a friend you can call or a family member who's a citizen and memorize the number of a lawyer. Yes? The reason why you do that is, let's say they take you in. You may not have the right, as soon as you're arrested, to to look at your purse where your right. phone number is. You may not have the right to look at your phone anymore. So that is why you have to memorize it. You need to have it in your head so that when you get that opportunity to make the phone call, you know where that information is and you don't have to access anything to get it. Yeah, right, exactly. You may have nothing. They may take you in and you can't keep any of your things. Um, so if you don't have legal status, one thing to be thinking about, if you have a passport from your home country, if you have a driver's license from your home country, uh, if you have an ID card from your home country, you should be thinking about where do you want to keep that. Because if the police can come into your house, if they have a valid warrant and they can come into your house and do a search of your house, they may find those things and they may find that you're not here legally. So one thing that we recommend is to get something like a safe deposit box or leave them with a family member or a friend who is a citizen so they're not in your house. So you want to be able to get them, but don't keep them in your house. Um, something for you to think about with your families, thinking about a family plan. So talking with your family, whoever you're living with, mother, father, aunts, uncles, grandparents, whoever you're living with, making a plan so you guys are ready in case anything happens. This is actually really, really important. Um, things that you would want to keep at home are things like your birth certificates, or if you have brothers or sisters, their birth certificates, medical records, um, pay stubs or utility bills. Those are okay to keep at home because they show that you've been living here. They show that you have been paying your bills. They show you've been getting medical care, and that can actually be really important down the road if you're trying to show that you have been living in this community, you're, you know, you contribute to the community, and you should have the right to stay here if you're trying to argue that to a judge. So that stuff is good to keep at home, and it's important to hold on to. 
Um, for for those of you with um, you know your parents, aunts and uncles, whoever's taking care of you, you should tell them this. Make sure that all information and emergency contacts are up to date at your school and any of your brother's or sister's school in terms of who can and who can't pick them up from school. This is really important to stay on top of so that um, you make sure that family members can pick up kids and then an immigration officer couldn't pick up somebody. So it's important to know who can and can't. So I know there are forms. I think every parent and fills them out every single year. Every guardian fills them out everywhere. Just make sure that you're up to date on those. Um, if you have a lawyer, this is more directed for the parents, but I'm going to say this for you guys to take to your guardians, take to your parents. There's something called a power of attorney document, which you might not have heard of, but it basically will let somebody else act on a parent's behalf. So if one of your parents is taken in by immigration, it will let somebody else make decisions on their behalf and make financial decisions, child care decisions. So this is actually really important to take back to your family. You can call one of the legal resources that we gave you to get, get some help with creating a power of attorney document. You can actually probably find one online and do it pretty cheaply, but just something that you can do to show who has the right to make decisions for the kids. And then if someone is taken into detention, we're going to talk about bonds, paying a bond, which is basically paying money to get released. You need to think about who, who is someone you know who's here legally, who, has the, who can get access to money, could get access to your bank account. If you set money aside to pay for a bond, um, to pay for an immigration bond, how do they get access? Do they have a debit card? Do they have a PIN number? Can they get the money? You want to be thinking about that in ahead of time. And I know this is kind of really scary stuff, but it's actually, it can be very helpful if, unfortunately, one of these situations happens. This is one of these things you want to think about. So did you have a question? No. Okay. Are there any other questions? I know this is a lot. Um, I think we covered this. Um, um, Patrice was mentioning if we, you know, you have the right to make one phone call, but memorize all the numbers. Here's some stuff that you also want to know because you may only get one phone call. You may only be able to make one phone call. So you want to tell them what jail are you being held in. And I think for immigration, I believe in Massachusetts, it's Plymouth and maybe Bridgewater. It's not here, okay? So it's over in the eastern part of the state. But people want to know, you need to know what jail are you in. What is your um, inmate ID number so people can find you? I don't remember what A number is, do you? I think that might be like your alien number, so if you're here as an alien, um, and your birth date. So if you are taken into detention, when you make your one phone call for the, with the phone number that you've memorized, tell them this information and tell that person to call your lawyer. So if you call a family member, if you call a friend, tell them, call my lawyer. Yes, yeah, sure. I don't know, nah, maybe not. The question was, if you have a phone call, you get your one phone call, and the person doesn't answer, do you get the right to make another phone call? I don't know the answer to that. Patrice, do you know? Right. That's a great point. Leave it on a machine. Yeah, so to answer the question, if you didn't hear, if they may only give you one call, and if the person doesn't pick up, you may not get another shot. So make sure it's somebody who has voicemail, and you can leave a voicemail with all that information. It, it may also be wise to let the person know that they would be your one phone call so right. that if you are calling them and it's an off hour or something like that, they know to answer. And it's a strange number. Let me just say that, too. If it's a number they don't recognize, pick it up, because it, it might be a number that they've never seen before. So go ahead. Um, at what point do people, get, do people get offered to make a phone call, or is this something people need to ask for? Or um, I don't at know. At what point will the person be told, OK, now you have the right to make a phone call? At what point does the person say, I want to make a phone call? Yeah, so the question was, will they? All students, please come to the office, Ayala, Chun, and 
So the question was, at what point will they give you the opportunity to make a phone call? Will they ask you or do you have to ask for it? I think that's probably going to depend on every situation is going to be different depending on what's going on. I think the important thing is to remember you have the right, and if they don't offer it, ask. Okay? So just ask if they don't offer it. Because they may not. Honestly, they may not offer it. They may do some processing before. Right. Yep. Yeah, but I think it's a good idea, and Patrice was saying there may be some things they need to do first, screening, fingerprinting, paperwork, but it certainly can't hurt to make sure they know you want to make that phone call, and they may say, okay, we got to do this first, but then just remember to keep asking. Um, if you've been arrested, you have the right not to give any information to immigration, including where you were born or where you're from. Um, this is really important. Remind your family not to give any information. They may come, so if you are um, detained or a family member is detained, immigration may come and ask other people what they know about the person who's been detained. They don't have to give any information. They don't have to talk. So same rights apply. Don't have to give information about anybody else. If you're in detention, if you've been detained or a family member is detained, I know this is this advice is really hard to hear because you want to see the person that you love and that you care about. Don't if you're undocumented, you should not go to see them because you're putting yourself at risk of becoming of being detained. So that's really important advice. As much as you might, you know, if if you have a sibling, if you have a brother who got detained and you want to go see him, you know he's in Bridgewater and he's detained, but if you're not documented, you should not go because you're putting yourself at risk of getting detained too. And again, just ask to call your lawyer immediately. I mean, that's kind of the main role to remember, ask to call a lawyer, and they will be able to help you. Yep. In addition to putting yourself at risk, you also could be putting them at risk if you give information that goes against the information that they gave. So right. it, it's not just protecting yourself, it's also protecting them in the long run in terms of their overall larger immigration right. case. Yep. Um, this, we don't have the website up here, but I'll have you guys take a look at this. If you think someone you know has been detained and you don't know where they are and you can't find them, there is a website that you can go to. If you just um, use Google and you um, Google Immigration and Customs um, Detainee Locator, you can look somebody up to figure out if they've been detained and where they are. So there's a way to do that. And this is, um, you can see that in the presentation, so you'd be able to, to look it up on the Internet. Um, I'm going to go somewhat quickly, just in the interest of time. I'm going to go a little bit faster. There's some stuff here about um, posting a bond. So if, if you've been arrested, if you've been detained, how do you post a bond? You may or may not be able to ask for bond. So bond, again, is basically money to let you out and let you be free while your case is being decided. So if they think that you're not... Um, a safety risk, a threat, they will let you um, sort of just be out and, you know, doing your regular day-to-day -day work, work, going to school, whatnot. You can ask for that. Um, that's basically an amount of money that someone would have to pay to be released until you need to come back to court. So you guys remember I talked about keep copies of pay stubs, keep copies of medical records, that kind of stuff. This is the reason why because that can make your bond case stronger. So if the judge sees that you've been getting medical attention, you've been here since you were a baby, you've been going to the same pediatrician for you know 15 years, that you have a job, that you work at Big Y or wherever you might work, and you have pay stubs showing that you're working, um, that you go to a church in the community and you're active in your church, those are really important things to show what an important member you are of this community, and that helps with your bond case, and it helps with your immigration case too. So that that's why it's important to keep records of this. I know sometimes people don't keep records. It will help you. And this is the stuff that is OK to keep in your home. You also should think about who could write a letter for you. So if you do get detained and you want bond, who could write a letter for you? Could a teacher write a letter for you? Could your boss write a letter? Could somebody in your family? Could a neighbor? Who could write a letter for you? So be thinking about who you could ask for help. Um, think about somebody who has valid immigration status who could pay for a bond. Um, this one's really hard, this next one. It talks about how much money you should have saved in case you need bond, and it's really expensive. But in Boston, which is where these cases are being decided right now, bond is in the range of $8,000 to $15,000. 
So I know that's a crazy amount of money to think that you can just set aside. If there's any way to do it, the advice is keep that money in a, in a you know, somewhere safe and have it there in case somebody does get detained so you can pay the bond to try to get them out. Make sure you tell the person who will pay your bond how to get your money, and we talked about that before. So, so the next piece is about do you have the right to see an immigration judge? So if you're arrested, you do need to see a judge to try to stop your deportation. You should talk to a lawyer always. But if you already have a deportation order, so if you were already ordered deported um, by a judge or at the border, they call it sort of, I, have you guys heard of catch and release at, at the southern border where people were caught and then they're let go, but there's a deportation order out? You don't get the right to see a judge again. That was your shot. So um, that in that case, you do not get the right to see a judge again. Um, if you've been in the country for two years or less, doesn't matter where you are arrested, you could, um, what's it's called expedited removal, which basically means fast, fast removal, you might not have the right to see a judge. So just so you know, you, you can't always see a judge. We just want you guys to be aware there are cases where you cannot always see a judge. Do you want to just kind of like, we can just go through it, but I think the one big thing is that 10 year rule. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to do this one? No. Okay. So I'm going to go into the immigration process. There's a lot here and I don't think we're going to cover all of this because we're already at 10 o'clock. I'm going to go through some of the, what we think are the most important parts of this. Um, there are a lot of different agencies that get involved with immigration enforcement. There's a, a whole bunch of names here, so you guys have those in your um, in your presentation if you want to take a look. Um, probably the important ones we put in red: Homeland Security, Department of Justice. Um, ICE is not in red, but that's a big one. And then it could be local police or local sheriffs or the state police. So those are the ones that you sort of want to be aware of. We just want you to know: lots of people get involved with immigration. Um, there's some ideas here about what to do if you are um, called into court. I'm not going to go into everything here. The main thing is go to court, okay? So in any case, whether it's immigration, criminal, civil, whatever, if you are ever called to a court, go to court. Don't skip a court date ever, ever, ever. Like if you take nothing else from today, take that. You always go to court. Um, because if you don't, you can create a lot more trouble for yourself. There's some information here about if you get a court date, um, where to go, where the court is. I'm not going to go into this in detail today. You can read this if you want to read about sort of the details of that. Um, if you were caught in another part of the country, um, you might get an order to go to Texas. You know, if you, if you um, cross the border and you might have an order to go to Texas, you have to ask to get the case moved to Massachusetts. So that's um, the phone number that you can call, that's actually really important. Because otherwise, if it's hard for you to get to Texas, which for most people it is, you might miss a court date and that would not be good. So you want to get the date moved. So here's a phone number you can call. And it does not happen automatically. They don't necessarily know where you are. So you have to tell them, I'm in Massachusetts now. I want to go to court in Massachusetts. You have to tell them that. Um, if you have a court date, speak to an immigration attorney. Um, immigration law, like I said, is very complicated, so you want to have a lawyer who can help you out. I think the last point here is important. Don't fill out forms on your own. Um, don't fill out immigration paperwork because you could, you could make a mistake without even knowing you made a mistake that could end up hurting your case. So that's why it's worth it to try to really get the help of a lawyer. I just, I just want to add how important it is to have an immigration attorney. Right. So just like you would not go to a foot doctor for open heart surgery, you would not go to a different type of lawyer for immigration work. It's super important. This I'm not going to get into. I think this is really, really technical about all the different ways that you could try to um, stop deportation. You can read this if you want. This is really, honestly, something for lawyers to cover. This is something a lawyer would think about is how can they help you stay in the country. Um, I think the point here is just there's a lot of ways that lawyers can make arguments to try to help you, and that's why it's important to have a lawyer. Um, 
again, these are these are some of the different reasons why you might be able to stay in the country if you're a victim of a crime, um, if there was persecution or torture in your home country, um, people have been abandoned um, or neglected by their parents, trafficking, domestic violence. Um, so there are lots of options, and again, that's why it's really important to talk to an immigration lawyer. They can help with figuring out what are what are your best arguments for trying to stay here. Has anybody heard of the 10-year law? Does that ring a bell for anybody? No? OK. So um, I think this is, this is kind of uh, like an, a myth that if you've been here for 10 years, you have the right to a pathway to citizenship. That is not actually true. So if somebody tells you that that is true, that is not true. So we just want to make sure people know just being here for 10 years doesn't mean you're on your pathway to citizenship. And People might have heard of Notario Publico. Um, they are in other parts of the world. They can help you with legal matters. But here in the United States, they are not lawyers, and they cannot give you legal advice. So, And some of them can be sort of uh, scams, like fraud. So not all of them, but some can be. So if you need immigration advice, don't go to a not Notario Publico. You want to go to a real lawyer. Oh, and the last point I'll just make here. If you also have a criminal history, so if you have immigration issues, but you've also ever been charged with a crime or convicted of a crime, it's really important to go to an immigration lawyer who understands criminal immigration issues, because that's even more technical. So make sure you ask the question, do you have, ex do you have experience in criminal immigration issues? Um, this is about where you would check in if you checked in um, with ICE, where you would report. I'm going to skip all this. This is, I think, the most important part. Do you want to cover this, Abby, or do you want me to? OK. So here's the last part, and this is the sort of most important thing. Where can I go for help? So um, what we gave you, you can see all of this at the end of the presentation. Um, we talk about talking to a lawyer. Yep. And then do you want to? Abby can tell you what these are. So we have some lists. Um, there are. There's a list with a yellow top on it, and those have Boston and some Western Mass-based attorneys. Um, but we also have a Western Mass-based list of people who can help you if you have questions or um, need legal counsel. Right. So if you don't want to go all the way to Boston, what's really in this presentation are Boston lawyers, um, which are pretty far. So that's why we wanted to give you guys stuff that's mostly in Springfield here, so you would have to f find a way to get to Springfield, take the PVTA. Yeah? The paper that you're holding up for local is something that is in the packet, or no? Separate. I don't, I think it's right over here. Yep, so we have those, and make sure you take those. Um, these are just more resources. So that's it. That's it for the presentation. So can we answer any other questions? You guys have, have really paid attention. You did a great job today. Thank you for listening. Thanks for having us. Yeah. If you have any questions, now, feel free to just come up and talk to us afterwards. We're happy to share what we can with you. So thanks for being here. And thanks to um, one second, guys. Stop, 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 stop. Everybody stop. Don't move. Don't hit anything out. Don't do anything. Don't go anywhere. Just stop. <laughs> so, talking about the schedule. So we're in the middle of first lunch right now. Okay? First lunch. So we're probably going to be here for a few more minutes. So let's say, let's say everybody's going to eat either second lunch or third lunch. Okay? So whatever your E period class is, we're in E period right now. Don't ask me <laughs> what the E period schedule is, right? You're going to have to go to your E period class or maybe... Can you? Well, all of the beginning and advanced ELL students have, is beginning and advanced, yeah, have a second, second lunch. lunch. Second lunch. Okay, so that's beautiful. We'll leave right here. We'll go right, we'll go right in here, right? Right to, well, no, we're in first lunch. Right, but when we finish with the question and answer, we'll go right to second lunch. Okay, I just want to say one more thing. Yeah, no, I just, I want, okay. But, listen, last thing, last thing. Beautiful. Hello, hello. So if you are not in an ELL class, you need to go to that class to find out what lunch you're in, okay? So you may have class and then have to come back for third lunch, okay? You were a terrific audience, thank you. Okay. So I just want to say a few things before we close up and, and people get off to E period. Thankfully, I don't 
I'm not very going to be very helpful with E period, but other people <laughs> will be. Um, so first, I just want to give another hand for our presenters who came in. So thank you very much. Um, and I want to just say one or two things about how this operates at the high school or in our school district. So I mentioned a little at the beginning, but I want to talk a little bit about safety in our schools. Uh, so in the past, ICE has given guidance that they uh, are not, they do not you come to schools and also places of worship. There's a couple of links. That's not a rule. That's guidance that they've followed. Uh, here in Amherst, we've passed a resolution, multiple resolutions and an upcoming policy that if ICE was to come to our school, they're not allowed in without a warrant, and then they have to go to me as a superintendent and then also our attorney as the district. So people should feel really safe being here. In addition to what ICE's kind of guidance is, we've taken steps that they can't just come into our building, uh, that they have to go through a formal process that involves me, involves Mr. Jackson, and involves the attorney for the district. So people should feel very safe being in our schools uh, based not only on ICE's, how they've operated in the past, but also the rules, the way that we are approaching how to support and make sure that the schools are safe places for all students. So I just wanted to reiterate that point because um, most of the presentation was out of school, about out of school time. But we've taken steps to make sure that in school remains a safe place for everybody here. Do you have any other thoughts, Mr. Jackson? Yeah, so just we're open for questions right now, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's, that's where we should go. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah. So uh, uh, thank you. Ms. Snowden reminded me of something that I omitted, which is thanking the interpreters for coming and assisting in making sure that everyone had access to the presentation. Thank you. Does anyone have questions? Because we have a little time. And so any questions you have, if the presenters can't answer the questions, they will write them down. And they will see if they can get the answers for us. So yeah. <laughs> so it's about the documents in the house. Yeah. So if you have a safe in your house or a locked drawer in your house yeah. with, do with the documents in there, would, it, would an ICE enforcer be allowed to, to force you to open that? I, I think I think if they have a warrant, they can. Yeah, they could. Yeah. So the question was, if you had a safe in your house or a locked drawer in your house, could if if ICE had a good warrant, so the one signed by the judge, could they make you open it? I believe that they could. But I'm, I'm Patrice has done a lot of this. It, so it's the scope. It's the scope of the warrant. So sometimes warrants allow you to enter, and then anything in plain view. Mm -hmm which would not include a locked door, right. is open. But other times they have a, a warrant that has broader in scope. You don't want to be in the position of interpreting that warrant yeah. day of. Yeah. So that's why. If they ask you, you have to. Yes. If, if, if they ask you to open the drawer and, and you're not an attorney you know, evaluating the scope of the warrant before you, that's not a time where you want to be arguing with them about whether you have to open the drawer or not. You, so you need to open yes. the drawer. Open the yeah. Drawer. Yeah. Yep. Another question. Yep. Um, yep. So the question is, if you are here undocumented but you pay your taxes, are you still subject to immigration laws? I, be I can't give legal advice. I believe the answer is yes. I, don't, I think the answer is yes. Um, in all honesty, everyone is subject to laws, you know, regardless. Everyone is always subject to laws. So I think the answer is yes, and I think if that's the situation, it would be a good idea to talk to an immigration attorney to see if you can get some help. Any other questions? Sure. So 
So the question is, if you're in a car with parents or friends and you get pulled over and the officer asks questions, can you have a conversation first with your parents or your friends before answering? Um, I think I think you could, but I think that that may cause some concern for the police officer of kind of what are you talking about? And is there something going on that I should know about? So my suggestion would be answer the officer. And um, are you talking about a situation where maybe only one of the people in the car speaks English? Yes. Yeah. So I would say the person who speaks English should answer the police officer. That would be my advice. Um, I don't know if you guys feel differently. And I, and I think what you would want to do is you would want to tell the officer that you That's a good point. are the only English speaker in the vehicle. So you will be answering on their behalf that's a good point. if that's okay. Yeah, that's great. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? You guys have great questions. These are excellent questions. Okay, well, if anybody has anything they want to talk about sort of one-on-one, -on -one, did you have a question or no? No. Uh, I guess you're saying if, if you have any questions you want to ask one-on-one, -on -one, they're going to be here for a little bit. I also wanted to remind everyone that there is a lot of information over here. You could take extra copies for other people you know, for f other family members. So help yourselves. And we are just going to go, everybody goes straight to E period. E period. Okay, because it's still, we're still in the middle of first lunch. Yeah, we're done. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.